Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this Personal Defense Network live Q&A. We're going to be talking about concealed carry equipment um, and whatever questions you have related to concealed carry equipment or concealed carry. Uh, my name is Rob Pincus. I'm the executive director, as you can see at the bottom of the screen. Perfect timing. Good job, uh, production guys. Uh, Personal Defense Network's executive director. We've been doing this for over 15 years. Um, not necessarily live events. Live events have only been around for a few years. Uh, but we have been producing content related to armed defense. Um, we started with training DVDs, and the very first DVD that we did was armed defense in public. And for the vast majority of people, that means defending yourself with a gun that you carried concealed uh, for some extended period of time, quite often before you actually needed it. But it's the preparation for that worst case scenario, that preparation to need to use a gun uh, that brings a lot of people to Personal Defense Network, to my classes, IC Training Company, to any of the other instructors and contributors that we've had over the years, dozens of experts in a wide variety of areas related to personal defense, health, fitness, medical information, all that kind of stuff, um, but especially armed defense. It really is the core of what we do at Personal Defense Network. Um, defensive firearms shooting skill development is the core of what I do as an educator on the ranges. And again, most of that, um, especially in the private sector, is, is related to concealed carry. Certainly a lot of um, open carry, in uniform carry, duty belt carry, with law enforcement, military, um, some security personnel, but for the most part, we're talking about concealed carry. And hopefully that's why you're here. I see um, a large number of uh, people in the chat here uh, that I'm looking at. I know there's a lot of different ways you could be watching this on a few different platforms. So um, if you have any questions at all, put them into the chat, um, put them into the comment section. And uh, I have some great people that are keeping an eye on all the other areas that will populate the chat role that I'm looking at on my laptop. Uh, to make sure that I get to those questions, if we can, in the next uh, 45 minutes or so. Um, I do see one question uh, jumped in already. That's great. Um, keep those questions coming. I want to put a couple of things on the board behind me here, just to kind of get everybody a little bit focused on, on what it is we're talking about today. Um, concealed carry equipment. Now, if you've ever been in any classes with me using a whiteboard, you know that this is mostly like code. Um, so you have to, <laughs> hopefully you can decipher it. Um, a lot of it's easier if you're actually watching with me while I speak, as opposed to uh, just kind of trying to figure out what it is later. Um, but hopefully you'll be able to read this. What we're talking about, of course, is the firearm, the holster, and other. Uh, and I'm going to put other just because the other may, may literally be nothing for you, right? It may just be about the firearm and the holster. That's enough for concealed carry equipment. Um, I don't like to pretend that, that you know, you're somehow negligent if you carry a gun, but you don't also carry alternative force. So you, you carry a gun, but you don't carry a spare magazine. Or you carry a gun, but you don't carry a flashlight. You don't have a pocket knife, medical kit, whatever it is. It's great if you can have all of those things. Um, sometimes you might have those other things and not the firearm. But today, I really want to focus on guns and holsters particularly, and sort of how that uh, most, the two most important parts of a, a concealed carry equipment um, really uh, relate to your preparation, um, to what we do here at Personal Defense Network, and to what you should be thinking about um, when you go ahead and look uh, shopping um, for any of that stuff. If you don't have it yet, replacing it, tweaking it, setting it up, all of those things. Um, primarily, we're going to talk about on-body carry, um, although off-body carry is a topic that you may be interested in. If you are, um, please throw a question down here in the chat. Uh, let's see, the first question I got, what do I think about compressors, especially on a small gun like a G43, a Glock 43? Well, I'm, gonna, I'm, not, I, I'm not sure if you mean suppressor or if you mean compensator. Um, so, so a, a compensated gun um, would be like a, a either cuts in the uh, slide and in the barrel that vent some of the gases um, in an upward direction, which help mitigate recoil, or if you mean an extension, um, like a, a multi-chamber, single chamber, or multi-chamber uh, compensator on an extended barrel um, that also are designed to vent gases up to help mitigate recoil, um, or if you mean a suppressor. Compressor could be either, maybe um, you can clarify there, Barry, in the uh, comment if I'm getting it wrong. I'm going to assume that what you are asking about is a compensator, um, something meant to direct gases in an upward direction to uh, help mitigate recoil. I'm not a big fan. 
Um, the, the, what I am a fan of is a longer slide to help mitigate recoil, to make your follow-up shots faster. Um, a longer slide will also give you um, a longer sight radius. Um, a longer slide and barrel will also give you um, extra pressure behind the gun, behind, or sorry, behind the bullet. Um, when it comes out of the gun, it'll be going a little bit faster. So um, one of the reasons, if, I don't know how uh, good an angle we have with the, uh, the camera over here, but um, this, this is actually a gun uh, that is marked G43L, and that uh, 43L is for 43 long slide. Now, the way it's set up today, it happens to be configured on a Glock 48 as it's meant to be. Um, on this side, it says Glock and it says 48 because this is a Glock 48 slide. When they originally came out, they were all this um, satin color. I actually have a, uh, I have two other slides um, for the, in the 48 configuration. One's an aftermarket slide, the other one's another Glock uh, True 48 slide, and it is actually being cut for a red dot as we speak. So Triple J Armory in Colorado is taking care of that. Probably gonna pick it up here in a few days uh, because I am considering switching to um, a carry optic on this Glock 48 configuration. So um, the, why do I like the longer slide? I like the longer slide because that, all the advantages I just listed, but also that's a way to mitigate recoil without having to worry about the gas venting issue, right? The gas venting issue sort of introduces new potential failures, um, but it doesn't, I think in this size gun, do as much um, as having the extra weight. Remember the extra slide, most of your weight in, in the po modern polymer framed gun striker fired guns, most of your weight's in the slide. So by adding an extra inch or so, right over like the Glock 43 length, that extra slide length of the 48, even when you put it on a Glock 43, which is how you get the 43L configuration, um, even with, with the smaller grip, having that extra length of slide gives you more weight out in front of the hand, and that's gonna help mitigate recoil um, at least as much as uh, having a compensator on here. And for like the small guns, like your Hellcats, the 365, um, the new uh, Shield Plus, and the Glock 43, um, with those small guns, when you put that compensator out here, um, as much as anything else, you're adding extra weight as well. So there is a difference between just dr you know getting a slide that's opened up and drilling the barrel and venting the gases and adding no extra weight, and in fact, taking weight away from the slide, um, it, it probably comes out to be about a net even um, when you think about what's really happening with the physics of the gun when you take away the weight but you vent some gas. Extending the slide, using a longer slide and having more weight out in front of the hand, that to me is a much better way to mitigate recoil. Um, it shouldn't be harder, we're talking about concealed carry today, it really shouldn't be harder for most people in most situations that are carrying inside the waistband to conceal the extra inch or two of length for a full size slide on a compact grip. Really grip is where you have the, the biggest struggle in terms of um, compromises you have to make in terms of uh, concealability. So. Think about that um, as a better way to mitigate risk, or sorry, mitigate recoil than uh, the compensator. What else do we have here? Um, Texas, long time customer to the website. Good, uh, I appreciate that, Roy from McKinney, Texas. Um, you know, this is a free event, so I, I will take a minute just to say, you know, if you are a new visitor to Personal Defense Network, if you saw a link on my Twitter feed or Instagram feed, or you saw some of the promotion from Personal Defense Network, or if somebody shared this event with you, we actually just did an event for people that are at our gold membership level. Um, there are hundreds of articles and videos available. There, last time I checked, there was over 900 uh, pieces of free content. Last time I really checked in with what we have here at Personal Defense Network. Like I guess we've been doing this for over 15 years, dozens of experts, all fields of, of information related to personal defense, safety, and security. Um, and we love making this stuff available for free. There's even more available um, for our paid membership levels. Um, so I uh, do appreciate you checking in from Texas, Roy, and reminding me to remind everybody that there's even more available to you with our distance education classes, you know, streaming DVDs. That we produced over 100 DVDs with Personal Defense Network over the course of the first 10 or 12 years we were around, and uh, all of that is available as downloads and streaming now, and obviously these live videos come to you as well, and there are special events for our paid membership levels. Let's see. Um, Barry Good, thank you for, uh, for clarifying you meant compensator. I'm glad that was the one I picked. Um, and the next question uh, comes in from Texas. Can I discuss carrying OC spray? Um, carrying pepper spray uh, or, or any kind of chemical um, irritant, any kind of chemical defensive tool is something that I personally 
choose not to do. Um, I, have I done it in the past? Uh, very, very rarely. Um, I've staged some chemical agents, um, sometimes in uh, public spaces and workplaces, places where I wouldn't have wanted to stage a, a firearm that were you know, un, unobserved or uncontrolled in an environment, but having that, that can of uh, pepper spray is certainly um, a viable option in terms of me not feeling like it's irresponsible to have that in, a, in an unsecured office space or something like that, like I would if I were gonna leave, a, I wouldn't leave a firearm unsecured. Uh, as a police officer, I've been issued it, uh, trained in it. I've been an OC instructor uh, for a couple, certified by a couple of different companies. Uh, I've certainly used it in the field. Um, every single time that I have used pepper spray in a law enforcement capacity, and really any time I've been around any other officers who've used pepper spray in a law enforcement capacity, I've gotten what we call cross-contamination, right? Or I've gotten contaminated as well, and I've suffered from some of the effects of the spray. And I think that, to me, is sort of the worst downside of it. It's, it's, you may very well disable an attacker, but you may also disable yourself. And if you're more affected than the attacker is, obviously that's, that's a, a net negative to your safety. Um, even if all things are equal, um, but you're not able to do what it is you want to do in the, in the next steps of the immediate aftermath of using that chemical spray, um, that can be a negative. Now, we've got a lot of information here at Personal Defense Network on chemical sprays. Um, I have worked with the Sabre Red Company. We brought in one of their experts uh, to help teach some of the information that we put out in a DVD well over a decade ago. And I know that there's some of that uh, information has been updated in video form. I think we have some articles on chemical sprays as well. Some people are huge fans and advocates of pepper spray, of chemical agents. Um, again, I personally am not. I find uh, that I'm pretty sensitive to them. And I would rather use other alternative forces from a firearm, um, you know, physical techniques, um, impact devices, uh, maybe even a defensive knife, um, even electrical um, devices like a taser um, would be my choice over chemical sprays because there is a less, there's a lower chance of it. You know, people talk a lot about, you know, a gun could be used against you or the, the knife could be taken from you and used against you. And, you know, pepper spray, you, you almost kind of, in any confined space, you're going to be using it against yourself um, as well as using it against the other guy. Um, so I'm not a huge fan of OC for that reason. Doesn't mean other people don't have, obviously come to other conclusions and that it may be the right tool for you. And there are circumstances where, again, as I said, uh, personally in the past, I have chosen it because I didn't want to have a firearm in that environment or I didn't want to have something that was you know, more expensive that could be stolen or could be you know, mishandled in a different kind of way with more permanent potential injury, um, like a knife or like a taser or something like that. So, um, so it's something to consider, um, certainly, in your, your collection of defensive options. Um, it's not one that I generally spend a lot of time with myself personally at this point. Um, newly minted NRA and range master instructor. What would you suggest I tell students who are inquiring as to the usability of laser aiming devices? Well, first, congratulations. Um, the range master uh, qualification course uh, to become a certified instructor with Tom Gibbons, who's been a personal defense network contributor from way back, um, from the early days. Uh, that is not an easy course to pass, so congratulations to you um, on that instructor certification. If I'm reading that right and you went through Tom's course, um, that is great. And as far as the NRA certification, you know, that is the most, uh, it's the most ubiquitous certification there is. A lot of states require it. A lot of ranges require that NRA certification for you to be able to do work. Sometimes it helps you get insurance. Like I understand why people are still seeking out that certification as well. Uh, so I, it's interesting because there may or may not have been specific coverage of laser aiming devices in the instructor training that you got. Um, obviously, if you're teaching a specific curriculum, then that curriculum should have guidance in there related to that. If you're just kind of teaching a defensive shooting course or general firearms instruction and you haven't um, been given any guidance inside of the curriculum for a class, you know, bullet point 3A covers laser aiming devices, um, then I, I think that you need to become really educated in any time you teach, you need to be really educated in the follow-up questions to your advice, right? So when you say, you know, I think you should use a laser aiming device, or I think you shouldn't use a laser aiming device, you need to be ready for your student to say why, right? And, and I'm the instructor guy isn't a good answer. Um, sometimes it is an answer, a real answer. Well, it's in, that's what's in this curriculum, and I'm certified to teach this curriculum, so I have to go by the curriculum. And you, that's a choice that you make as an instructor. And it's really bad if you have to like undermine the credibility of, of your own integrity and the curriculum's integrity by teaching something you don't agree with. And I know a lot of instructors uh, will find themselves in that condition sometimes in the public sector or because of concealed carry permit requirements. Um, but in the, in the private sector, in the, in the free world, right, you get to choose what you teach and educate your students about. And I appreciate that you're asking my advice. I want you to think about this uh, and see if it resonates with you. If it doesn't, 
Obviously, you have to come to your own conclusions to be able to tell your students what you think. Um, again, there's always going to be information you can look at here at Personal Defense Network um, on video and in article form. I know we've covered laser aiming devices. For me, if I had to choose between a white light being added to a carry gun and a laser aiming device being added to a defensive carry gun, I would choose the laser aiming device. And the reason is this, the laser aiming device expands the circumstances under which you can use a gun to defend yourself. And I know this is something we've covered a lot on different videos. And in fact, we just covered this in our spring uh, product showcase. So we did a product showcase from my home range, Ancient City Shooting Range down in St. Augustine, Florida. It was me, um, Don Edwards from Green Line Tactical, uh, Derek Poole and Barrett Kendrick, who are the co-hosts of Training Talk, PDN's live show that's actually airing tonight also. That's the third of three live events we're putting on today. Um, and Kevin Dixie from No Other Choice Training joined us. And one of the things we talked about um, was Steiner products that we were showing off in that product showcase was how you can use a laser aiming device to predict where your bullets are going to go responsibly using the gun requires you being able to predict where your bullets are going to go aiming right how you can use a laser when you can't bring the gun to your line of sight and you're outside of contact distances right so when we think about using a gun you know, we are first and foremost when we're at extension, we're shooting in an extended shooting position, it's my line of sight that dictates the line of the gun, right? So I'm looking at the threat, I'm looking where I want to shoot, I drive the gun out into my line of sight and that's how I get my alignment, right? So I'm controlling where the bullet is going to go, or at least I'm trying to predict where the bullet is going to go simply by kinesthetically moving the gun into a position that is aligned with my line of sight. Now, if I want to use the sights that are on the gun, or if I want to use a red dot, then I'm going to be getting my alignment between the front and the rear sight, and then sight picture, which is the relationship between the alignment and the target, or I'm going to pick up that red dot and get a sight picture, which is the relationship between the dot and the target. So when I do that, I close an eye because I can't line these things up in front of two different points on my face, right? So I close an eye, focus on that front sight, and now that's how I'm aiming, and that's how I'm getting a higher level of prediction about more control. We have less deviation, more control over the gun, higher level of precision. I'm going to be even more specific about where I'm predicting this bullet's going to go as I press the trigger. If I can't get the gun to my line of sight, none of those options are available to me. Right? So in the case of an extreme close quarters event, if I'm within two arms reach, well, then I can pull the gun back in against my body. And if, if I was just you know, shooting at, at, at the edge of this, this is actually a TV screen. It's not a graphic. I know in some of, the, some of the angles, depending on what you're looking at, it might look like a graphic, but there's actually a TV screen here. If that were a person and I were to drive the gun out to shoot them, obviously they could grab my gun, deflect the gun, push the gun out of the way. So keeping the gun in against my body, I can predict well enough where this bullet's going to go because I've practiced shooting in this position and the gun is very protected from this person being able to grab it, wrestle it, move it out of the way or anything like that. If I, however, were 20 feet away from someone and I were injured or for some other reason unable to get the gun into my line of sight in an extended shooting position and I were forced to, if I were going to shoot, to choose between shooting from here, this compressed position, or not shooting at all, well, if someone's 20 feet away from me, it's going to be hard for me to reliably predict, especially under dynamic, chaotic, combative circumstances, whether or not that bullet's going to hit their body. So it would be potentially recklessly negligent for me to pull a trigger when I can't predict where the gun is going to go. But if I have a laser on the gun, well, now I can predict where the bullet's going to go because the laser on the target or not on the target is going to tell me something about where the bullet's going. Now, this is a CERT pistol. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with this, it's got this particular one has two different lasers. It's got one laser that um, activates as you start pulling the trigger, and it's got a second laser that activates as the shot breaks. So if I turn the gun back here towards the screen, you'll see that red laser dot, and then you'll see a second green laser dot that actuates or that, that is activated when the shot actually breaks. So I'm going to put my finger on the trigger just to kind of give you an idea of what I'm talking about, where that, that red laser is. Right? I can now predict that if we look at you know, concealed carry equipment, if I just point the gun up in that general direction, well, I can hope that I'm pointed. Let's say I want to shoot carry. I can hope that I'm pointed at carry. But if I had a laser aiming device, well, I can know that I was actually pointed at concealed and I can lower my aiming point down to carry and then break the shot. So even in this really awkward position, which clearly is not a, a standard shooting position, I've got my grip is compromised, I've got you know, big compression here on my wrist, and it's just a really odd angle, but I could accurately predict that I'm gonna hit carry as I press that trigger 
because I have the laser aiming device. So if I had to choose again between a red dot, uh, you know, a compensator, a uh, white light, any of those things, or a laser aiming device, it's the laser aiming device that actually expands the circumstances under which I could use my defensive tool. Now, with something like the Viridian, uh, you've seen me use a light laser combo a lot with them um, on rifles and pistols. You've seen me demo that, the Steiner uh, object, uh, I forget the, uh, the, the name of the, the exact product that we used um, with them back during the product showcase, but you can go back and look at that video. Um, Don Edwards and I did a, a talk about a wide variety of Steiner products. One of them was also a combination light laser. Um, they're, every company virtually that, that is a quality company now offers a white light and either red or green laser combination unit that can be attached to your carry pistol. So there are a lot of people who advocate for having a white light on your gun. I'd rather you had the handheld light and a laser module. You can certainly have a laser and light module on your gun, but I still recommend that handheld light as your primary illumination device. Let's see. I was at the firearms, I was, I was at firearms instructor, a firearms instructor, firearms instructor, 13 years, wondering what is your opinion of the Urban Carry G3 evolutionary uh, fanny pack design that I've seen is the one that came out of the Czech Republic um, from Aegis Academy. Um, it was copied by 511, the exact same design. It's a very low profile design for a fanny pack um, that holds a full size gun because of the way it was designed. So you can see some of those videos we've got um, at PDN and you'll see some of the same themes. The number one most important thing with any carry system, whether it's, it's on body, in a holster, in a bag, number one most important thing is that you practice with it. You have to get the repetition over and over and over again. Um, so, so consistent wearing it, you wanna wear it kind of in the same way. Um, again, with a, with a pouch, preferably, and again, it's something we talk about a lot, a pouch that is only for the gun, right? In other words, so I'm gonna keep my you know, wallet in here and car keys in here, and over here I'm gonna keep a snack or a water bottle or whatever. And up in this area, I might keep my, uh, I don't know, chapstick or who knows what, my extra cash, uh, hidden extra cash pocket, whatever's gonna, I don't know, whatever you're putting in here, right? This is for the gun. So this is where the gun, maybe an extra magazine, maybe a tourniquet, but really I, I only want that pouch to be the emergency area. And I want to make sure that I have a, a good solid tab, um, one that's large enough to find quickly, one that is secure. This one has a, like a rubber coated extended loop around the zipper. Uh, I want to make sure that I can, it's something I can get a hold of very easily. I want to be able to open it with uh, when it's on my body. I'd like to be able to open it without having to brace the bag with my strong hand, but so my weak hand only, right? So you imagine if I were wearing this, I could pull this open because it would be attached to my body or attached to my belt. And that allows me to have my strong hand free so that when, it, when I finish the opening, now I can reach down and get my hand on that gun. And once again, I want a consistent presentation of the gun inside of the pouch. So practicing in a way that, you know, the gun, when it's inside the holster module, which is inside the pouch, in the dedicated area, underneath the easy to open zipper or Velcro or snap or whatever it is, when I get it open, I wanna reach in without having to look and know that my hand's always going to be on the gun. Once again, inside of a, a some kind of uh, secure, whether it's the pouch or a specific holster, which is what I would prefer, maybe one of the modules um, from our, from our crossbreed uh, modular belly band design or one of their OHI modules, one of those modules or something that will protect the trigger from being actuated. I don't want to reach into the pouch and potentially hit the trigger with one of my fingers and have the gun go off. I also don't want to carry without a round in the chamber. So that trigger has to be protected. The gun has to be oriented consistently in order for me to be able to grab it efficiently and safely. And that's going to mean a holster uh, product inside of a dedicated pouch that's easy to access and I can wear consistently. So I think those are kind of the big training tips and pieces for that. Um, one of the other things that I mentioned earlier in, the, in the, the gold membership live is this importance of if you're going to carry that way, you have to be able to train that way safely. If you are out on a range and an instructor or range officer or somebody's telling you like, hey, you can't carry that way or you can't practice that way here, there needs to be some why, there needs to be some follow-ups because if it's so reckless, what they see you doing or what you're doing is so recklessly dangerous that you can't pull it off in a controlled training practice environment, you definitely shouldn't be doing it out in the real world. What you should be doing out in the real world is signing up for our newsletter. Um, we're about halfway through, maybe a little more than halfway through uh, this free question and answer uh, dealing with concealed carry equipment here at Personal Defense Network. And I just want you to listen to this quick message about our newsletter and why you should definitely be registered to be receiving it for free. 
I'm Rob Pincus, the Executive Director of Personal Defense Network. For over 15 years, we've been producing some of the most important and informative content in the area of armed and personal defense. If you're interested in learning more about what PDN has to offer, the best way to do it is signing up for our free newsletter. Our newsletter features some of the top names in personal defense education. Not only do I provide content on a regular basis, but we have some of the best people in the martial arts world, the armed self-defense world, and security technology worlds producing content for this free newsletter that you can receive into your email simply by signing up. It's also gonna lead you to some of the other great options we have at Personal Defense Network, including full online distance education courses and our gold, platinum, and premium membership levels that give you even more content. Sign up for the free newsletter today. All right, there you go. Real easy. Join up, become a registered recipient of our free newsletter. And if you want to join the premium level, the gold membership level, you want to go download some DVDs, you want to do all that stuff, spend some money, that's great. You'll get more information that hopefully you'll find valuable just like you get from our free content. Um, but that newsletter really will draw your attention to special events like these live Q and A's, to the training talk show, let you know who's going to be the guest or let you know when a new video gets posted or when a new opportunity to train with a new training tour instructor, or we're adding a new venue, we have a new sponsor, a new piece of gear. Year. That newsletter just helps draw your attention to what's going on at PDN. It's all available for free, so uh, maybe as soon as we're done here, you'll run over there and, and get registered and you know sign a friend up, friend or two up as well, get them involved. Uh, let's see, we have a few more questions in here. I'm going to try to go a little bit faster because there's actually a bunch of questions that have been added while I've been rambling on. Uh, the first one, um, just real quick, Alexander, uh, tuning in from Switzerland. I appreciate that. Switzerland is actually the last. European country that I trained in um, right at the end of February uh, to last year, 2020. So unfortunately, it has now been 14 months um, since I've been able to get back to Europe because of the, the pandemic and the travel restrictions and things like that. Um, but I do anticipate getting back over to Europe to teach classes again by the end of the year. Um, Italy is definitely on the list. Switzerland is definitely on the list. Um, either the Czech Republic or Slovakia are on the list. So um, definitely uh, you will see me on the schedule again coming back over to Switzerland. I've actually been teaching in Switzerland since 2000. Six or seven, I think, was the first time that I taught in Switzerland, and I've taught there um, every year. Um, it's, it's probably the only European country that I'll be able to say that I've taught at every year because I did sneak a class in there before uh, we stopped the travel over the Atlantic, um, and I got back here the first week of March, right before we canceled the tour last year. So um, thank you for the interest, and uh, yes, I'll be back over there. I'm usually near um, Luzon uh, on the uh, east side of the, uh, the lake there. Adding optics on concealed carry guns seems to be all the rage this year. Um, what's your opinion? So it, it's funny, I mentioned that um, I have a slide being cut right now that I'm gonna be putting uh, a 507K, Holosun 507K on, um, which is their narrow, slim uh, red dot. Um, it's very small optic designed specifically for, for single stack, for narrow guns. And um, it, it's taken me a long time to get there. Uh, red dots on rifles, I was a really quick early adopter, made all the sense in the world to me on a rifle for a whole bunch of reasons. I have listed the reasons many times um, in articles and also in videos here at Personal Defense Network that explain why I have not been an adopter nor have I been an advocate for red dots on pistols. And I've been paying a lot of attention to it. It's not something that I have not considered. I've considered, in fact, going back as far as the mid-90s. Um, in, the, in the 80s, there was a product called the EPC, the Electroprismatic Collimator, uh, that was designed for defensive use. Um, I thought it was completely ridiculous um, and almost impossible to use in any kind of a dynamic situation. Um, but that was the first time I did consider, I actually own one, I still it's done a box somewhere, I'm sure. Um, I first considered putting one of those on a defensive gun in the mid-90s. Um, in the mid-90s and the late 90s, I was also doing um, competition with pistols. So I was doing competitions with um, centerfire and rimfire pistol where I had red dots on pistols and I certainly still own some of those guns. I've been very familiar with that technology and used it, but I've never thought it was uh, going to give me any kind of significant advantage that was worth the cost or the potential negatives and drawbacks and new potential failures that come with that equipment being mounted on a carry gun. Well, that's changed. Um, over the years, the, the products have gotten more reliable, more affordable, um, they've gotten smaller, and they've gotten more convenient. I've seen more and more students use them successfully over extended periods of time out on the range, and I've got more and more uh, friends that I've seen teaching techniques that really shorten the learning curve, make it much easier to use. Um, Don Edwards, he's one of our contributors this year on the Personal Defense Network training tours with Green Line Tactical. 
I took a course with him last year, and actually the course I took during the uh, corona break, taking the tour off, meant I got to go take some extra training myself and extra practice time last year um, during the pandemic, and I took a course from him that he does as a transition course for law enforcement personnel moving from traditional sites to red dot sites. And that really opened my eyes to some specific training techniques and teaching techniques, and in fact, I had him attend the IC Training Company Instructor Conference that we held back in March to share some of those teaching techniques with our team of instructors because these things aren't going away and they're only becoming more reliable and more affordable. You know, I mean, just a handful of years ago, you had to basically double the cost of your firearm to have a carry optic, right? Because you had to spend a couple few hundred dollars on getting the slide cut and then you had to spend several hundred dollars on the optic itself. And then there's the learning curve and you have to spend more money on the ammo and all of that. Well, now almost every major manufacturer has every significant part of their defensive carry firearm line come pre-cut with, with slide cuts for some kind of red dot sight or maybe a universal cut that you can put adapter plates on for mounting any type of sight. Um, even the Avidity Arms um, PD-11, the gun that we're still trying to bring to market, the latest evolution of that project is now pre-cut for a red dot sight, specifically that 507K um, that I'm getting a Glock 48 slide cut for. So I have not made that leap yet, um, but I certainly have spent a lot of time with a lot of different carry optics been thinking about how to teach um, for years when people show up, uh, how to teach them better to more efficiently utilize the red dot, and especially the enclosed emitters, um, like that 509 from Hollow Sun or the, the Acro um, from Aimpoint. Those enclosed emitters really do solve a lot of the potential failure points of the red dot sites. So as those are available um, for less and less money every year at a high level of reliability, I think we'll see more and more people adopting um, the red dot site on their carry guns, and you might even see me uh, carrying one as well. In fact, I, in this very studio, I did a, a relatively long video kind of really going into the weeds on this topic that will be released um, here at Personal Defense Network relatively soon. I think that is scheduled to be released in early June. So you'll get to see sort of my latest, greatest evolution. You're getting a, a sneak listen to that uh, insight now. So while I used to, you know, two, recently, just a couple years ago, I was telling people not to waste their time, not to waste their money, learn how to shoot, learn how to use your, your traditional sights, kinesthetic alignment, maybe a laser aiming uh, device like we talked about earlier not to bother with the red dot. Um, now I would not tell people to avoid it. Um, I certainly don't think you need one. Um, again, I don't think there are that many circumstances in typical defensive shooting situations where it would really enhance your ability to use the gun defensively. Um, but outside of those parameters, especially at higher levels of precision, obviously longer distances, red dot can really make a lot of difference for uh, many, many, many shooters. So it's something um, certainly that can be considered now, and I think much more responsibly than it could have a handful of years ago when it really just seemed like a, a little bit of a, a faddish trend. Helps you on the range, but does it really help you uh, in a defensive shooting? We don't know. So as the cost comes down and as it becomes less of a liability and less of a, a negative potential in terms of reliability, um, then you know, sure, have one on there. Let's see. Um, PDO, uh, does PDN have videos on using defensive knives? We do, Ted. Um, Alessandro Padovane has done most of our defensive knife use training from Safer Faster Defense. Um, he is based on the West Coast. Um, he actually is, uh, has moved to the U.S. from Italy, um, but he developed um, some really efficient um, techniques for defensive knife carry, def defensive knife use. Uh, that are very congruent with um, sort of everything else we do at Personal Defense Network and everything I do. He's one of our instructors inside of ICE Training Company, um, and he's got some great information. So you're going to see uh, there's some articles um, as well as videos that are available. Um, and we do have complete full DVDs that you can you know, download, the DVD length content that you can download as well. I think we did two full DVDs with Alessandro over the years. Um, Let's see, what recommendations do I have for carrying a spare magazine for concealed weapon? Worry about pockets, contaminating magazines, how do you conceal a mag pouch on your belt? I'll tell you what, um, it's a good question, Tony. I have not actually worn uh, a mag pouch in plain clothes, other than law enforcement work. I, I have not worn a magazine pouch to carry a spare magazine in, in I don't know how long. I mean, I'm sure it's been a decade, maybe more than that. Um, I tend to just take my spare magazine and put it in my back pocket or put it in a jacket pocket. Um, so I do not worry about the contamination. I don't worry, you know, it's not like it's, it's sitting in, in a, a pocket that, of, of the same work pants that I put on every day in a dirty, dusty environment, and I never open that pocket to check on the magazine, right? So the magazine's being handled um, immediately before and immediately after. I would be going out with it in that pocket or, or in the jacket pocket. 
I tend to, to shoot my ammo a lot. I tend to rotate through even my carry ammo a fair amount. Um, so a spare magazine to me um, is, is something that you're carrying at least as much because you need to recover from a malfunction with your primary magazine or a malfunction in the firearm that you strip the magazine out of to clear as it is for extra ammunition. You know, when you look at something like the shield magazines, we're talking about carrying 15, 16 rounds in a relatively compact small gun. I'm not anticipating uh, a situation which is going to require 17 or 18 or 19 or 20 rounds. Now, there's nothing wrong with having extra ammunition in case you find yourself in, this, in an incredibly extra double rare event where you have a defensive gun use that requires that many rounds, um, but at least as much for the extra ammunition reason, carrying a spare magazine is about recovering from, uh, again, hopefully a very unlikely malfunction you could have with the firearm, the magazine itself, your, your primary magazine, or um, the ammunition or something like that. So uh, no, I do not um, carry a magazine in a magazine pouch. I think the best way to do that, if you're going to do that, is carrying it inside the waistband. So if you're carrying your gun inside the waistband, then your magazine pouch is probably also going to be inside the waistband. And then it's just a matter of comfort um, and, and position, right? So um, a lot of people will call it a sidecar um, is the concept. And I think you're, that might even be a trademark kind of brand name, product name. But I hear that colloquially used um, as well for um, one holster unit that has a magazine pouch um, built into it, usually angled off towards the weak side. So for me, it's a right-handed shooter. This would be my appendix carry, um, carried just off of center line to the right, and then um, maybe a little bit higher and angled this way, I would have a magazine pouch potentially, right? So you see that. Um, I do see some people carry magazines horizontally on their belt, um, either in front of their body or, or even um, on the small of their back area, like on their weak hand side. So for a right-handed shooter, it would be you know, like the seven o'clock um, area, seven, eight o'clock. Um, that's an option as well that keeps the uh, magazine from printing vertically, especially if you're carrying something like, I think I have one right over here, like an oversized um, magazine. If you're carrying like a Glock 26, let's say, but you have a Glock uh, 19 or 17 magazine as your spare, um, carrying this vertically, um, even inside the waistband, might print um, depending on how you're, how you're carrying and what you're wearing. Um, so carrying it horizontally can be an option as well. Uh, let's see, we're getting ready to finish up here. Uh, try to get to all of the questions I've got in this chat. I'm not sure if I will. What are my tips? Uh, oh, we talked about that one. Not allowed to carry in Canada, but appreciate anything on carrying and deploying mace, uh, dog spray. Yeah, well, again, I, I touched on that um, a little bit at the beginning, um, John, in Quebec. So. Uh, if you can, uh, maybe you know, as soon as this as soon as this is over, go back uh, in the beginning and talk about um, pepper spray. The the biggest thing for me with pepper spray, you know, that I had that I didn't say earlier um, would be to train with it with your weak hand, right? So you want to be able to to you know use it as at extension away from your body um, with your weak hand. Um, most of the good quality pepper sprays that are out there, or bear spray or dog spray, I would hope you would be able to get your hands on uh, what's called an inert trainer. Now the reality is when you look at the cost of of the the whole thing, right? The the chemical agent itself isn't really all that pricey, but the nozzle and the can and the label and all the stuff that kind of goes into it, um, all of that costs money too. So you don't really save that much money by buying the inert practice um, chemical spray cans. So you know, if you have to buy two or three of this exact can you're going to carry and use one of them for a couple of practice deployments, I think that's a really good idea. You, know, you can imagine if you buying a gun and never shooting it, you know, A, to you know, get familiar with it and practice with it, but also to be efficient with it in the, in the heat of an emergency. Kind of the same thing. I see a lot of people do that with pepper spray. They buy this pepper spray or they give the keychain pepper spray to their daughter or their mom or whoever, and then you know, not, never even a, an idea of how to practice actually using it, right? And that's a problem. So getting a couple of those cans and obviously, you know, make sure the wind's at your back and you know, you're shooting it out of extension and you're not contaminating anybody else. You're in, a, you're in an environment where it would be appropriate to uh, spray if it is real um, dog spray, bear spray. Um, but practicing is, is really important and I would definitely recommend, um, again, doing it with your weak hand. Whether you, you have a firearm or not, um, not occupying that strong hand for something, it, you know, it's not as fine a motor skill. Um, you're, you're, not at, you're not aiming it quite as much as you are a gun or a taser or anything like that. So being able to do it with your, your weak hand would probably be important. Uh, let's see. 
Uh, we've got a PDN product showcase link in here. That is good because we put out a bunch of good information. That was a lot of fun. We're going to be doing a fall product showcase as well. So if there's a specific product um, that you want us to feature, or a product line or a company that you want to see featured, um, when you check out the one we did in March uh, from the spring, we're going to do another one in the fall. Um, you know, maybe reach out to that company and let them know you'd love to see them uh, talked about on Personal Events Network with our team of uh, contributors we'll have out on the range. Let's see. Lost live feed. Hopefully you're back. Um, what's more important, a very stealthy holster or one that provides a quicker draw of the pistol? Um, your choice is the Sneaky Pete. Well, Rich, it, it, all carry is a balance of compromises. All right, so we've got, you know, concealability, comfort, um, retention. You've got carryability just in general in terms of size and weight, things like that. Um, one of the classic examples is, is like the sweat shield kind of idea, right? Like, do I want a holster that has a, a, a lot of material behind the gun to keep the gun off of my body? Or do I want a holster that has very minimal material behind the, the gun up against my body, which allows me to get a more complete grip around the gun, right, in terms of my thumb? Like if this were all covered up here, um, and I reached down here and I was not able to get my thumb in contact with the gun, I would not be able to get as good a grip um, before I pull the gun out of the holster and I'd be adjusting my grip afterwards. So, so there's a lot of compromises that happen and, and I tend to find that the, the deeper the concealment or even in, in the marketing and the advertising, the more emphasis a product, a holster puts on concealability, then the more it's going to impede a smooth draw. And, and to me, the magic of a smooth draw is it starts with how good a grip you can get on your gun. So when we were teaching this, you know, we tell people, oh, you're going to have your, your natural reaction. And the first thing you need to do is get as good a firing grip on your gun as you can before it starts to move from the holster. Well, if you have to move it from the holster or move it from your carry position, like down in a pocket or something, before you can even begin to attain a firing grip, you're impeding your draw, as far as I'm concerned. You're not just, it's not just a more difficult draw, you're getting in the way of drawing the gun for defensive purposes. So um, that, that to me is really an important part of the balance. And then there are people who will say, well, if I carry in a way that is more accessible to my hand, I'm going to print and I'm in an environment where I can't print or I don't want to print or it's illegal to print or it's against the, the rules of the, the business that you can carry as long as nobody ever knows. If anybody sees your gun, then you're going to lose the privilege in this workplace, you know, whatever it is, um, then you have more to consider. And then you're obviously balancing that compromise out in a different way than I choose to most of the time. Um, but, but it's really important to acknowledge that. I don't think there is a yes or no here. There is a be aware that with deeper concealment comes a compromised ability to grip the gun, which means that your draw is going to be impeded, potentially fumbled, potentially slower. And that could make a big difference, right? Obviously, in that, that life and death moment. So um, be careful how you balance all that out. Let's see. Um, the video feed froze. OK, sorry about that. But yes, um, after this ends, the, you'll immediately be able to go back and watch it again. Um, so this will be posted through Personal Defense Network. You'll be able to watch this video in its entirety if you lost the live feed. And abdominal surgeries and back injuries make appendix and strong side carry painful. Best option, shoulder, belly band, cross draw, other. Um, Belly band, um, you know, it's interesting you throw belly band in there. It, that may, you may be talking about the, the height of where the gun is. In, in other words, carrying up a little bit higher on your torso. Um, I recommend wearing a belly band so that the, the holster top is still at the top of your pants. So your, your belly band is really more of a waistband the way that I wear it and the way the, these um, ones that I've helped design are meant to be used. Um, but having said that, uh, where if the belly band is more comfortable for you than on the belt carry, it's probably, depending on how you're wearing it, probably a better option than switching to shoulder carry, um, switching to off body carry or, or carrying in a bag. Um, the holst, uh, you, pocket carry is very slow, very hard to do um, efficiently, hard, almost impossible to get the gun out sometimes when you're seated, if you're carrying in a front pocket in like jeans or, or dress pants. So um, cross draw might be a really good option. You know, um, some people, I actually had a, a student on the range in my class, I was teaching in Iowa uh, a few days ago, and I had a, a left-handed student who essentially was carrying uh, where they had to reach across their center line to get the gun out. 
So the gun was carried appendix style, but it wasn't carried um, at their strong side just off of center. It was carried on the weak side just off of center. So they were essentially, you know, some kind of a half combination between, um, let me make sure I can get into the camera here. Where am I going? All right, there we go. You got it? Yeah. So they were carrying where they reached across their center line to draw the gun, but it wasn't a traditional cross draw where it was angled. Um, and that can sometimes present an issue of, of uh, printing in a little bit, bit, little bit more aggressive way if the magazine uh, well and the magazine base of the grip are poking out in front of you. And that's really the, the downside here. If you go all the way across to where you're really going in across like this, this can compromise your draw in close quarters as well. Um, so you might think about more of a vertical appendix carry just shifted more over towards your weak side. That may be an option for you. Um, or the belly band where you carry a little bit higher, um, where you're, right, you're not on the, uh, the actual crease of the hip, so to speak, the crease of the leg. Um, so a couple different options, but shoulder holster is really a dramatic um, difference. Pocket carry, which you didn't even mention, which is good, is also a dramatic difference. Um, I would try to avoid changing that as much as possible. You know, the, the indication here being uh, maybe I would do appendix carry, but I can't, so that you want to stay as close to appendix carry as possible and try to change that. What is an assert pistol? Ah, so this is CERT, S-I-R-T. Um, so CERT pistols are a training pistol. Um, it's sh shot indicating resetting trigger, I believe is what that stands for. It's from Next Level Training, NLT. They've been a, a great partner and friend of Personal Defense Network since the very beginning. Um, they host courses. I'll actually be teaching a course up there with the CERT pistol guys in Washington State later this year. Um, and you can learn a lot about them, S-I-R-T, right here at Personal Defense Network. In fact, that little commercial uh, that, that ran, I was using um, their rifle training device, which actually takes this CERT pistol and inserts it into a shell that um, you can set up to, to emulate the configuration of your defensive rifle as well. We are just about done here. Um, 1987, uh, viewing on YouTube, asks, is Streamlight laser light combo any good? Yeah, it's nothing wrong with the Streamlight product. Um, personally, most of, I think every gun, every rifle or pistol that I currently have set up, um, staged for any kind of defensive use, whether it's at my place in Florida or place in Colorado, uh, is a Viridian um, light laser combo. But there are a lot of other companies. I mentioned Steiner earlier, Streamlight. Um, there's certainly a Crimson Trace. There are a lot of good quality companies out there that offer different products. Um, but take, again, take a look at some of the uh, information reviews that we have here at Personal Defense Network. Here's one of the things that, that happens. Some of the products you'll see um, are maybe not the current product line because we, we reviewed something two years ago, three years ago, four years ago, five years ago. But you might find that you know, if, if it was a good quality product from a good quality company three, four, five years ago, Chances are it's still a good quality product coming out of a good quality company. It just might be updated, longer battery life, brighter laser, brighter white light, different features, whatever it may be. So, um, so, so that, that, that information, even if that product is discontinued, the valuable information might be about the company or the product line or how to use a certain feature. So even if it's an older product review, it might be worth taking a look at. Um, have an MMP shield, love it, reliable. I want to carry appendix, I assume that's what you mean, but hesitant to do knowing the firing pin is already half ready, and my fear is until trigger pull, uh, opinion on gun being carried appendix. So I do, um, I'm glad you love the information, Steve. I do carry appendix. Um, I understand the, the risks of carrying appendix. I understand the risks of carrying a gun, period. Uh, as, as you noted, you know, the, the condition of the firing pin or the striker uh, the distance that the trigger has to travel, um, the presence of a uh, hammer or not, uh, the presence of a manual safety or not, um, the heaviness, the weight of the trigger, all of the th these things play into whether or not you could have a negligent discharge. Here's the number one thing that, I, that I'll, I'll tell you, and I'll, I'll move a little bit, and I think the camera can, can find me over here. Um, and what I'm gonna show you is the presentation from the holster. Now, now I've, I've taken my holster and put it up on the table here, but this is a CERT pistol, again, it's just a laser pistol. Inside my waistband, I know that I'm very likely to lower my center of gravity, right? When I get into a position when, when I'm startled, or I'm scared, or I'm in a defensive fighting mode, even if I'm just saying, hey, you back up, and I'm thinking about going for my gun, I'm gonna be in a weight forward position with my hips closed. Well, that means if I try to draw a gun from appendix, I'm either coming up into my rib cage here, right? Or I'm going to be pushing the gun forward and pointing it back in at myself. So what I want to do is push my hips forward as I reach for the gun. 
And by pushing my hips forward as I reach for the gun, now when I get my grip on the gun and come up out of the holster, the gun's already pointed in front of my body, right? And then I angle it this way and I lower my center of gravity back down as I extend out into the shooting position. Same thing when I reholster. When I reholster, I'm gonna be back in this high compressed ready. I'm gonna push my hips forward again, flatten the gun out, fold it down into the holster and then push it down where it's still pointed in front of my body the whole time, right? So the technique and these, te you'll be able to see this more clearly in, in the videos designed to teach that issue here at PDN. So go ahead and take a look at some of those videos about proper use of an appendix uh, position holster and proper presentation and reholstering. And maybe that'll put some of your concerns at ease. They are valid concerns, um, but the concern really is about, you know, covering yourself and you can, you can screw that part up regardless of how you're carrying the gun, where you're carrying it, um, and making, that, or making contact with the trigger or letting anything else make contact with the trigger while the gun's coming out of the holster or especially going back into the holster. Those are the things we're worried about. So a good quality holster, worn appropriately, practiced technique, and proper technique are how we avoid that, that tragic accident. Uh, do I ever not carry a gun but carry other weapons? Um, I, I do. So uh, the, yeah, for example, I, I, I was doing a, uh, I've done, this is my third live event today. Also, I will not be part of the training talk that Derek and Barrett are doing, um, the third one from PDN, but the first one that I did today was a distance education course for uh, mental health professionals. And we were teaching uh, about talking to the gun community, about serving the gun community better, um, you know, being what they call culturally competent about the firearms community. And it's the idea is like, you don't have to be a gun owner. Maybe you don't think anybody should be a gun owner, but if you want to be able to help me as a gun owner, you have to, you know, give some legitimacy to my beliefs and have some empathy for them um, and respect for them, uh, for me as an individual holding those beliefs. And yeah, guns are part of my life. Um, but we did talk about times when it's not appropriate to carry a gun. And, and one of the examples I used was when I'm drinking. So if I go out to dinner, I'm going to a steakhouse, I'm going to order a bottle of wine along with my steak, I'm not going to carry a gun. And while that is probably common sense to most people, and it's probably the law in most places, there are also places where it's completely legal to drink in public while carrying a gun, as long as you're not intoxicated, right? So you can drink and then you can drive, but you can't drive if you're impaired or if you're intoxicated, and that's gonna cause a potential problem for you legally, as well as just the irresponsibility of it. Um, so I choose not to carry while I'm drinking, and I, that, but that does not mean that I don't have other defensive tools, right? So you, weapons, defensive tools, I might have a pocket knife, um, I'm not, we talked about this earlier, I'm not likely to carry OC spray. I might have an impact device, um, one kind or another. I might have an improvised tool, right? Or a clandestine defensive tool. When I'm on a plane, I'll be, fly, I'll be on a plane tonight. I'm not gonna have a gun, but I will have my medical kit, for example, um, on my ankle. And I will probably have one or two different things that are either in my jacket pocket or within reach or in my front pocket or and certainly you know in my carry-on bag that could be used as defensive tools so um yeah there are many times that i'm carrying defensive tools other than a firearm sometimes just by choice right i just choose not to be carrying a gun right now but quite often it's in what we would consider a non-permissive environment where i can't choose a gun i don't have an option gun when the question earlier came about teaching in europe when I'm in Europe, I generally can't carry a gun around um, outside of the training environment. I don't have access to firearms in most countries. So in those countries, I'm carrying other defensive tools, right? I, I, I've said many, many times, you know, being armed is a state of mind. It's not a physical condition. So, so you know, the, the, when we talk about arming oneself with a, with a tool, the act of arming yourself is to obtain 